Good afternoon. Welcome to LWMA webinars. Um, welcome back. To, well, welcome to 2021. We're delighted that you would join us um, again for another year of wonderful webinars. Um, we are starting with TMO and Brexit part two, following on from part one at the end of December. If you didn't watch that, you can actually access that on our webinars page. Um, and we'll send a link out to that after the webinar. Today, joining us, we have Rachel Stirat, Head of VAT and Financial Services and IPT at HM Treasury, and Andrew Tucker, Head of VAT Reliefs, Deductions and Financial Services, HMRC. As our lovely host for today, we have Ed Blight, who is the LBMA Chief Financial Officer, who knows many, many more things about this than I do. So I'm going to hand over to him and he's going to take this away. Well, thank you, Taylor. That's, uh, that's a very kind introduction. Um, and welcome to the second webinar on uh, Brexit and the TMO. Um, some of you will recall the webinar that we, uh, we issued on and ran live on the 10th of December 2020. And uh, we covered many things. And this next slide, if you could put that up, please, Taylor. This next slide covers uh, the items that we touched on, and I thought it would be useful to run over this prior to going into the next stage. Um, so at that time, of course, uh, there wasn't a deal in place between the EU and the UK, uh, and we were very much uh, looking at what assurances we could give to the market on the way things would be, come what may. So we looked at local London, we looked at the impact of the TMO and the judgment on the TMO, and the Article 260 letter, and it became clear from that that, um, that, that there is no, going to be no impact on the industry itself. It's very much a UK government to the European Union uh, matter that will be dealt with, and the UK position is business as usual. We covered some aspects of logistics and what the potential impacts might be for each of the, the metals. We looked at some risk mitigation strategies that have been in, uh, put in place by our member organisations. And we also looked at the future regulatory framework review um, and how that's going to adapt the Financial Services and Markets Act 2000 to define the post-EU regulatory framework. And the final thing we touched on is that the phase two consultation of that review was extended until the 19th of February 2021. So that's what we covered uh, back on the 10th of December and what's changed since. Well, uh, the UK uh, ended its transition uh, process on the 31st of December uh, and are now not part of the EU anymore. But more importantly, a deal was reached between the UK and the EU. And this webinar represents a very early opportunity um, for us to examine the potential implications of that and also to look at the practicalities of how we're going to be operating in the, in the London market uh, going forward. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Rachel to give us an update from the Treasury. Rachel, over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, to introduce myself, I'm Rachel Stewart. I am the head of the financial services branch of the VAT and Excise team at HM Treasury. Obviously, this case on the terminal markets order has been something we've been working a lot on over the last few years. Um, and following the ruling in May, we have been considering what impact, if any, it has on UK legislation. Obviously, we've now entered a new phase in terms of our relationship with the European Union, in terms of having left the transition period, and thus we are no longer governed by the European VAT Directive. Um, and thus, our uh, UK law is is the law, and that is what businesses can continue to rely on. I think it's worth um, emphasising that throughout this period, businesses have been able to rely on UK law as written, and unless any changes are made to that, there is no suggestion that there is any change to businesses' position. So the terminal markets order is part of the UK legislation now and remains as such. Looking to the future, obviously, um, there are opportunities for looking at how we want to tax financial services more general, generally. 
in the future um, outside the European VAT system and indeed at the budget last spring the Chancellor announced that there would be an industry working group launched to look at the case for reviewing the VAT treatment of financial services um, and we hope to be able to start that when capacity allows um, as capacity has obviously been taken by responding to the COVID crisis. Regarding the terminal markets order, um, obviously we always try and keep our legislation under review, but the general principles that underlie it seem to work. Um, I know that there are some you know, challenges around the exact application around the edges, but on the whole, this is a system which has worked very well for the UK, for the UK's markets, for government. And if we are looking at changes, that would be with a view to how you improve what we have. Regarding what this means in terms of UK EU relations, um, obviously there was a case about what the UK law was in relation to EU law while we were first a member state and then bound by the transition period and we are continuing to engage with the commission um, as they've made public they have started um, a further process engaging with us on the fact that the UK did not implement any changes following the May ruling. Um, this will be an issue between the UK government and the European Commission. Um, obviously we are no longer obliged to align with EU law and so for from an industry perspective that will be something that happens in the background without any real impact on firms um, as we've said before there's no suggestion that there's any that firms have failed to pay taxes that they owed or that there's any anything owing from taxpayers firms relied on uk law as it was written they can continue to do so um, this is now simply a matter between the uk and the eu under our dispute resolution mechanisms. Um, and so as we look forward, we are considering what opportunities there are, whether there are further things we need to do in this area, and we look forward to continuing to work closely with industry on these issues. Well, that's great, Rachel. Uh, uh, thanks for that. That's uh, that's a good update. Um, so it's interesting that we've got this uh, working group uh, looking at VAT and treatment in financial services area. And of course, the opportunity there will be to engage with industry participants and organisations such as ourselves to ascertain the impact. Um, and I'm assuming that's the strategy going forward on all of this is to continue the consultation. Of course, um, as as you know, our approach to tax policy making is to, to engage, to consult, to make sure that we understand thoroughly how, how any changes proposed will affect industry and indeed what challenges taxpayers are facing. Um, obviously, I am not the person who is engaging with the VAT system as a business every day. That's, that's your members. and we really appreciate the input from industry groups, from firms, so that we thoroughly understand what's happening on the ground and what's working, what's not, and so that we can consider those issues as we advise ministers on the very complex decisions they have to take. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, and of course, now we're in this situation when we, um, when we did our first uh, webinar on, on the 10th of December, of course, we didn't have a deal in place, but we do now have a deal in place. And uh, I'm wondering, is it too early now to give an indication as to how that uh, may have impacted the way we're looking at uh, across the market at the moment? I think obviously um, deal was done very recently. Um, I think, you know, obviously uh, a no, tar no tariffs on goods is a huge um, a huge achievement for the UK economy as a whole and is something that's that's really important. Um, obviously, the EU remains a major market um, very close to the UK, and so there will be ongoing dialogues between the UK and the EU. Um, and I think as we work through these, we're very keen to understand where there might be 
any new niggles where there might be new opportunities. Um, um, as ever, we're very ke keen to hear about any of those issues as they arise, um, as is often the case in negotiations with, or indeed within the EU, um, deals are often done very last minute. Um, so it does mean that things take a little time to bed in. Um, and we're very keen to hear if there are particular challenges that are being faced so that we can address them. And, and I'm sure our members will be uh, very keen to uh, to offer those those uh, views on what's happening across the market at the moment and their concerns. I mean, obviously, we're we're talking to an audience now which is not only UK based but EU and rest of the world based. Um, I, and again, I, it, I'm assuming there's assurances that um, we're continue to operate uh, unchanged uh, as as far as they are concerned as well. And certainly from, from a UK perspective, for the rest of the world, of course, nothing has, that hasn't changed. Um, obviously, you know, the UK remains open for business and we remain a global hub for, for this industry. And I know that that's something ministers are very keen to maintain and continue to promote. Well, Rachel, that's absolutely fantastic. Thanks very much indeed for that uptake. I really do appreciate that and for you giving us your time. Um, uh, and just a reminder, if you do have any questions, uh, we will take those and bring them to you um, uh, and respond to you afterwards. But I think that really, uh, that update from Rachel really gives us an opportunity now to, to look at what the strategic view as far as the UK government is concerned and the environment in which the London market operates. And it gives us the opportunity to turn now as to, to look at the the day to day challenges um, that we'll face in how all of these things are going to operate in the, in the new year. Um, so that segues neatly into into Andrew uh, from HMRC, um, who will give us an update on on how things will operate and where we see the priorities in the in the short, mid to long term. Andrew, over to you. Thanks, Ed, um, and thank you for inviting me. It's, uh, it's, it's always nice to be asked. <laughs> um, so uh, just for uh, those who are watching, my name is Andrew Tucker. I head up the VAT um, Reliefs, Deductions and Financial Services policy teams within um, HMRC. It's been, um, it's fair to say it's been a busy year. Um, so I just wanted to uh, briefly, before moving on, um, just reiterate uh, a little bit of what Rachel said um, about the uh, TMO, um, but from a HMRC standpoint, um, as, as Rachel made very, very clear, um, you know, uh, as has been the case all the way through this, firms can rely on UK law, um, nothing has changed. And that's absolutely the case in terms of how HMRC are approaching this as well. Um, uh, any transactions etc will be viewed in exactly the same way um, nothing nothing has changed and that is going to happen um, at any point soon either um, so I just thought it was worth reiterating that that from a sort of HMRC policy and compliance point of view um, in that regard it's, it's business as usual um, so uh, Rachel obviously highlighted there um, some of the sort of uh, high level uh, policy things that uh, may be happening, particularly the um, Financial Services Working Group on uh, VAT and, and the look they'll be taking at that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit, um, I guess, uh, about the uh, Memorandum of Understanding, the um, MOU mm -hmm. uh, between um, HMRC and yourselves, um, because I think um, at a practical level, um, that's probably uh, the area we can um, most immediately think about and start to look at and think, okay, so, so what can we do here? Um, I think in the short term, something I'm very keen and one of the reasons I was so keen to, to, to come online today actually uh, because it gives the people um, which, uh, it doesn't always happen um, I think in the short term um, one of the things I would be really keen to do um, is to see if there's anything in the MOU um, 
that is immediately fixable or immediately changeable. Um, and to some degree, I think we're relying on both yourselves and your members to feed back around that. Um, I mean, I know it covers a number of different areas, obviously, whether it be the particular um, uh, transactions that are undertaken, the different types of trade, etc. But it strikes me that, you know, it was written in uh, 2013, I think, a little bit before my time, but, uh, <laughs> um, and things have moved on quite significantly, whether it be the political context or the way in which businesses operate, et cetera, et cetera. And that strikes me as uh, it, it seems, this, this moment in time seems ripe to look at it in two ways. And the first, as I said, is are there any um, ways in which quick wins might occur? Things we can hopefully in discussion change fairly quickly to make, make the MOU work better for us. But as, as I said, I think we're fairly reliant on yourselves and businesses to come to us there with the things that perhaps aren't working from your perspective and we can have that discussion. And so I guess I'm making an appeal now <laughs> that if there are things that aren't working, perhaps for yourself, um, please do raise that and then we can see if there's um, immediate take to try and address some of that. Obviously, that's with the caveat that there's no guarantees we'll agree. <laughs> uh, but that's why actually this sort of event's so important because it enables us to have those discussions um, and, and to move things forward where we can. Um, I guess the other point there, and this also is specific to the MOU, but perhaps a bit wider as well, is longer term. And you know, Rachel was reflecting on the extent to which um, uh, about what the working group might recommend, etc., uh, um, as, as potential ways forward. Um, but I guess longer term, any any substantive sort of changes to the MOU or to the way that we work with business are going to are going to need to take account of um, where that piece of work. Uh, takes us. Um, but I would very much emphasize that um, we're very, very keen to make sure that whatever's done at sort of um, high level for policy perspective, we operationalize in a way which works for everybody. Um, and so from our perspective, it's going to be absolutely key that we keep these discussions going that we are very aware of the types of issues that you're facing um, at an operational level um, uh, so that we can take steps to address those and make sure that what ultimately emerges is a sort of long-term direction for financial services, well, VAT and financial services in this country, that, um, that our practice reflects some of that and is gonna, is gonna work for you as well. Um, with regards to the MOU, I think it's probably scope as and when it becomes clear the direction we're taking to, to really look at that fundamentally. Not quite there yet, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, I'm guessing the message is that um, we're, I'm guessing the message is that we're, we're really, that you're keen to address quick wins there, um, but that uh, the whole a wholesale overhaul of the the MOU is is perhaps a little bit down the uh, down the line as we wait for post Brexit initiatives to to smooth out. Is that what we're saying? I think that's a fair summary of, of what I'm trying to get across. Yeah, I think I think so. I mean, I think um, it, it, it's I wouldn't want to do something with the MOU that we then had to do again in a year's time because it turned out that actually for whatever reason uh, it wasn't quite appropriate anymore. Absolutely, and I'm sure um, our members uh, listening and our non-members that are listening will put issues to us that uh, we can channel through our own our own groups and then put a, an industry perspective to uh, towards those quick wins and indeed the longer term development. Yeah, absolutely, and I'd, I'd be very keen that they did. <laughs> Excellent. Now that, that's really good news to hear that, and uh, and we're looking forward to bringing that to, uh, to you um, in the near future. Um, there's another issue I just wanted to bring uh, bring up with you. Um, in 2019, uh, an HMRC note was published um, um, talking about um, the application or the reclaiming of VAT 
um, on imports of materials, which was having yep. an, an, issue, an impact on, on the refining sector here in the UK. Um, and then again, in, in late uh, 2020, there was a clarification note sent out, which then touched on um, agency status and Section 47 uh, arrangements. The initial confusion with the 2019 note is that it talked about um, appropriate procedures or the correct procedures without actually stating what they were. And it seemed as if the, uh, the 2020 note um, uh, seemed to suggest that agency status and section 47 was the right procedures to uh, um, apply. I wonder if you were in a position maybe to give some kind of clarification for, uh, for the audience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the first thing to say uh, is that the 2020 note was primarily aimed at clarifying um, what we meant by ownership. Um, it was so the 2019 note went out. Uh, there were a number of queries around that. Um, there was a suggestion that um, the title had to have passed uh, at the point uh, at the point at which the VAT was being reclaimed. That isn't the case. Um, actually, as long as the right to dispose of the goods has has passed over, and at some point the intent is that um, title word, then from our perspective, that's what ownership uh, means, um, and that satisfies the requirement. Um, in terms of uh, agents and regulation 47, so the, the main reason that was put in was because it was a query that had been raised off the back of the 2019 note. Um, right. And uh, in essence, if um, uh, an agent has uh, applied under Regulation 47 and it's gone through the usual process and agreed, then um, for the purposes of reclaiming, then they will be able to do so um, in, in the usual way. And yes, that's essentially the correct procedures for an agent to, to do that. Um, so I'm glad I've been able to clear that up, I hope. Um, it's, uh, but but yes, I mean, I think um, that is the right way to go forward. Okay, so um, that's really useful. Thanks, thanks for that, Andrew. And I'm sure if there are any questions, any further questions on that, we can act as a conduit to channel them to you and we can uh, communicate that back out to our members as well. So thank you for that update. Um, from, and my takeaways from that is that there is a keenness and a, and a willingness to engage uh, with us to, to deal with immediate quick wins and priority issues that we may see that exist and that there is a willingness to do what you can at this stage without trying to unnecessarily constrain what may need to be done in the future. And anything that is done in the future, much in the way, as we discussed with Rachel, is very much going to be a consultation piece looking to build on and construct perhaps what the MOU needs to look like going forward and into the future. But it's very much going to be something with the market to allow the market to operate properly, taking into consideration our EU members and our global members and everyone that operates with the market in London. Absolutely. Whatever we do, we want to get it right for everybody. So. Absolutely. That's absolutely wonderful. Thanks very much indeed, Andrew, and thanks for your time today. Well, that uh, concludes this webinar, and, um, and, I, and I hope uh, that's been able to clarify um, from a government perspective and from an HMLC perspective um, what the situation is now what the level of engagement is that we can look forward to um, going into the future and what the longer term plan will be in terms of uh, how we manage the tax um, regime uh, in the UK using the MLU style of framework uh, to support the market and the continuing function of the market as, as the centre here in London. Thank you very much indeed for your time and your, and, uh, your patience in listening. Um, Taylor, back to you. Thanks, Ed, um, and thank you to uh, Rachel and Andrew um, for all of your time today and um, all of the effort that's gone into this webinar. Um, we really, really appreciate all the work that you've done to help us deliver this information um, to our audience. Um, uh, if you, as our audience, have had any questions about the material today um, that wasn't fully explained or that we didn't um, cover at all, please do email us at ask at lbma.org.uk. Um, we will forward on your questions to the relevant parties um, and let you know when we get a response. Um, so please remember to do that. 
Additionally, um, I'd like to announce that our 2020 webinars are CPD accredited now. So if you do want to get your accreditation certificate, please email events at lbma.org.uk so we can send one of those out to you as soon as possible. Uh, lastly, um, we have our upcoming webinars. So next week we have our trade data webinar and we're welcoming back the popular faces of Adrian Ash and David Cornell from Quillian Vault and LBMA respectively. Um, they will be joined by Fergal O'Connor and he is from the Cork University Business School. So I'm expecting a very, very lively discussion next week and I hope that you can join. Uh, the 28th of January is still TBC, um, but don't you worry, we will have a really wonderful webinar for you on that date. And uh, the last one that we have upcoming is February 4th, Chinese New Year. So we have our uh, resident Hong Kong expert, Jeremy East, hosting a panel of speakers um, to discuss gold around Chinese New Year. Um, this will be a pre-recorded webinar as well, owing to the time difference. Um, so we hope that you can um, can uh, either attend or listen. Um, and I want to thank you all again, Ed, Andrew, Rachel, thank you for your time. And as always, follow us on social media. Goodbye. <laughs>